Thank you, Martin. And also, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation uh, for the meeting, which has already proven to be quite uh, stimulating from day one. And my talk today is concerned uh, about a phase space formulation to relativistic quantum theory. And it is not so much about putting quantum physics and classical physics together as such. Uh, but my view is that there's more work needs to be done on either side of the divide when it comes to relativistic uh, physics. And uh, the talk is based on a recent paper uh, I have put up on the archive uh, with uh, my collaborator, Lane Houston. So uh, let me start with classical physics. Uh, so we are looking at Hamiltonian formulation of relativistic mechanics. Now there's a long history of this. Many of you will know about this. Uh, going back to Dirac, uh, who tried to formulate uh, relativistic physics in the language of Hamiltonian mechanics. And part of the motivation, perhaps the main motivation, is that Hamiltonian formalism is amenable to quantum mechanical description. And therefore, if you can describe using the Hamiltonian language, then uh, that opens up the possibility uh, of bringing towards uh, uh, quantum theory. And ultimately, uh, I suppose that led to subjects like canonical quantum gravity that our chairman uh, knows a lot about. Uh, but going back to uh, the classical case, so there are various different approaches being proposed, like, such as constraint formalism and so on and so forth. But uh, perhaps the simplest and one of the very effective approaches is the so-called uh, cotangent bundle approach uh, due to Marsden and, and others. And the idea itself is a rather simple one. So we take the Minkowski space point X and then we form a cotangent uh, space for the momentum variables. And then we introduce the Minkowski flat uh, space metric GAB to the uh, momentum space as well, so that we can raise and lower indices. And then we write down Hamilton's equations of motion in a familiar uh, form, where the parameter S is regarded as uh, the, the proper time associated with the particle. And this approach turns out to be fairly effective. Uh, in yesterday's, yesterday's discussion, someone, I think Dennis or someone else mentioned that uh, for relativistic uh, mechanics, if you have many particle systems, there's a problem. But in fact, uh, there isn't really a problem. Uh, the approach is quite effective and it sort of works. However, there are limitations. And here are some limitations. Uh, firstly, the formalism itself does not allow uh, the momentum to uh, become uh, space like or even. Uh, past pointing. So for any given specific problem, one can set things up so that this won't happen. But as a formalism, uh, it's not uh, satisfying that if you have to uh, prevent such a thing to happen uh, manually by hand, so to speak. Uh, so that's a, it's like a minor problem with this approach. Uh, but more importantly, looking ahead, uh, there's an issue to uh, formulate field theory based on this approach. And the reason is because the cotangent boundary space does not admit a uh, complex structure which is needed to do field theory. But putting that in a different way, uh, there is no recipe to construct an expression of the form X plus IP uh, in a meaningful way. And the reason is because X and P have different dimensions. Now, in the talk yesterday on quantum field theory, we noted that in a quantization of oscillators, such an expression appears quite frequently. And the reason is because in that case, we have the coupling constant, the, the, the string constant, which allows us to modify the dimension so that we can fit these two together. But this won't work in a relativistic context uh, because we don't have string constants. Uh, we only have uh, fundamental constants uh, uh, at hand, and you can't just simply uh, 
take the cotangent boundary and construct such a complex expression in a meaningful way. And another issue is to do with the parameter S in Hamilton's equation. Now Marsden referred to that as the proper time, which is fine if you're talking about a single particle system, but if you have multi-particle systems, then the question is whose proper time S is gonna be. So there are some uh, ambiguities here as well, but all these issues can be resolved if we move on to uh, another space called the future Q rather than looking at cotangent boundary. So what is uh, future Q? Now, uh, this is a domain sitting inside complexified Minkowski space. So let us start all over again. So we write M for a Minkowski space with the usual Minkowski space metric with uh, the signature plus, minus, minus, minus. And if you have a pair of Minkowski space-time points, X and Y, then depending on whether uh, the separation distance is positive, negative, or zero, we say that they are space, uh, time-like, space-like, or new se separated. So we use to draw a little picture. So if you have a time-like separation, you sit inside of the Nikon, or if you have a new vector, and then you have a space-like uh, vector. And furthermore, if uh, the separation vector has got the first component, the time component being positive, then we say that the vector is future pointing, and otherwise we say that it is past pointing. So that's just uh, the terminology. Now, uh, what about complex Minkowski space? Well, this is simply C4 in, endowed with the Minkowski space metric GAB. And the future tube that sits inside of the complex Minkowski space, uh, we call it gamma plus, uh, points of the complex Minkowski space of the form X minus IR, such that R is time-like and future pointing. That is to say, R squared is positive, and R zero is also positive. Okay. Now the word future tube is misnomer because of the minus sign here. Uh, so in reality, we take the past tube and that's the definition of future tube. But because the, uh, the, uh, the con this is a convention which is so standard in quantum Q theory, we're not going to try to fiddle with, uh, with the definition. Okay, now the future tube uh, plays an important role in quantum field theory for the following uh, reason. Uh, if you take the vacuum expectation value of the field operators, so these are the Weidmann functions, uh, then these uh, expectation values turn out to be analytic on the future tube. And then using the techniques of complex analysis, one can uh, recover the entire field theory from these vacuum expectation values. And that's why they play a very important role in field theory. But of course, future tube, they don't contain the real space-time points because we have strict inequalities here. Okay, so the real space-time is not included, corresponding to where R equals zero. However, <clears throat> one can apply complex Lorentz transformations on to points in the future tube, and it turns out that uh, these transformations can reach into part of real Minkowski space-time points, and these are called uh, the Yoshi points. And then analyticity extends, and therefore, uh, by knowing the values of the vacuum expectation values on the Yoshi points, we can construct the entire theory. Um, <clears throat> so that's where one that's one place where future tube appears quite in a prominent way. Uh, another place is the Penrose uh, Twister program. Uh, so if you haven't uh, come up across with that. So in Twister theory, we have a three-dimensional complex projective space, which is endowed with uh, indefinite metric of plus, plus, minus, minus. And then upper half of the Twister space and lower half of twister space is separated by new twisters of real dimension five. And then uh, points of the complex Minkowski space 
correspond to lines sitting on the uh, digital space. The future tube corresponds to the totality of lines that lie entirely on the top half. And they also play an important role in the, the panel's uh, digital program. But again, uh, this is introduced for a matter of convenience because you can use complex analysis, which is extremely powerful. And at the end of the day, one has to revert back to the reality condition, whether you're talking about quantum field theory or digital theory. In other words, uh, the complexification of the Minkowski space, the imaginary part does not have any physical meaning. Okay, it's done by mathematical convenience. Okay. However, and I think someone mentioned about uh, Mackie's book on quantum mechanics yesterday. If you're a fan of Mackie's book, you would say, well, surely uh, we can regard such a space as a phase space of some sort, a complex combination of X plus I times something. Maybe that R can be related to uh, momentum in some ways and regard gamma as a physical phase space as opposed to purely a mathematical object. And it turns out that the answer is yes, we can do that. Uh, and here's how it works. So if we have a combination, an expression like X minus I R, where R is related to the momentum, and we only have the fundamental constants of nature, then if we recall uh, the uncertainty relation that uh, Martin mentioned yesterday, uh, which shows that X times P has a dimension H bar. And therefore, H bar divided by momentum has got dimension of X. So we want to regard R not as momentum, but rather inverse of the momentum. Of course, uh, uh, P is, the momentum is a four vector. So what do we do? We can't divide by vector, but what we can do is to apply what is called Kelvin inversion. So going from R to P by setting R equals H bar times P over P squared. And it's a symmetric co uh, construction such that P is given by R in the same way. And this Kelvin inversion is a map of forward light cone into itself. And therefore, if R is future pointing, then the momentum is also future pointing in the past. So we change the variable in this way. And then to work out Hamilton's equations in our R inverse momentum variable, we just have to uh, do a simple calculation. So we want to relate d over dp uh, with d over dr, and a short calculation gives us an expression like that. And likewise, dp ds is related to dr ds by that expression. So that's a short calculation. But now let's take this uh, term appearing in the, uh, as a coefficient here and call that h a b, which is minus one over r squared times the Minkowski metric minus two R A R B divided by R squared. And let's call the coefficient up here, uh, K A B. So which is that object here. And it turns out that H and K are inverse to each other. And then the Hamilton's equation in terms of R can be written in this form. Okay. Now I'm not too interested in the Hamilton's equations here but I'm actually interested in this HAB, which dropped out as a result of change of variable. And this HAB one can prove to be positive definite. And therefore it defines a Riemannian metric on the future Q. And in fact, I wrote a Riemannian metric, but in fact, it, it is a canonical metric of the future Q. So it's the Riemannian metric on the future Q, which uh, just comes out. And this is of significance already because uh, even though the indefinite metric structure of the Minkowski space is very much there, uh, as a phase space, the metric is positive definite. And that suggests a way to build a quantum theory over there. Uh, and incidentally, the as for the parameter S, uh, this can now be, be identified as the arc length parameter associated with the metric in an um, ambiguous way. So we have a phase space, which is a symplectic space, but also a Riemannian metric, met metric, and they are compatible to each other, and they form a space called a Kähler manifold. 
uh, with Riemannian metric H AD. And it turns out, and this is, uh, as far as I know, a new result in special relativity, that the space time transformations then generate symmetries on that space. So uh, if you're familiar with, with uh, sort of uh, Hamiltonian formulation of quantum mechanics, uh, which goes back to Dirac, but uh, it's mostly about done by Tom Kibble in late 70s. So if you, instead of looking at the Hilbert space, but looking at the space of rays through the origin of Hilbert space, then uh, Schrodinger's equation can be written as Hamilton's equation. And special, the ray space is a projective Hilbert space. It's a complex manifold of constant positive curvature. And then uh, you can write on Hamilton's equation on that manifold. And not every Hamilton's equation gives rise to uh, unitary equation. So the Hamiltonian function for quantum mechanics is refined uh, such that it has to satisfy certain uh, uh, harmonic uh, equation. The Laplacian acting on Hamiltonian has to be proportional to the Hamiltonian. Uh, and then you get unitary theory of quantum mechanics. Otherwise, you get so-called nonlinear quantum mechanics that uh, Professor Diozzi mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, as for space-time transformation, the situation is entirely identical. So the transformations are governed by Hamiltonian law, but not every Hamiltonian is generated space-time transformations. They have to satisfy exactly the same harmonic uh, condition as in quantum mechanics. The only difference between quantum mechanics and uh, special relativity is that the state space, the phase space, in one case has got constant positive curvature, whereas the other one has got constant negative curvature, which is what we have for gamma, for gamma class. Okay, uh, so that's a side remark. Uh, what I wanted to do is to build quantum theory on top of that. And for that, we consider a Hilbert space of holomorphic functions uh, on the future Q. Now, suppose that phi n denotes an orthonormal set of bases on that Hilbert space. So integration over, uh, in terms of uh, the Lubeck measure over the, over the phase space, uh, phi n phi n bar gives you delta n m. Okay. Now with respect to this basis function, we can define a reproducing kernel of the future cube of the phase space. And it is defined by this expression up here. And it is also known as the Bergman kernel. And this kernel itself is independent of the choice of the orthonormal basis function. And in the case of future two, one can work out what the kernel function is. And it's given by this expression down here, which we're going to uh, be using uh, quite frequently. So the, the idea of reproducing kernel Hilbert space is going to be going to play a very important role as I'm going to uh, describe. Okay, so we have a Hilbert space, and therefore we can form a quantum state on that Hilbert space. And quantum states are given by a density matrix, uh, rho, uh, such that uh, it is positive. So for any element of Hilbert space C, this integral has to be positive, and it also has to uh, have trace unity. So the sum of the diagonal element of the density matrix equals one. So that represents a quantum state on that uh, on the Hilbert space over phase space. In particular, uh, if there is a holomorphic function, a wave function, if you like, such that the density matrix can be written in that form, then we say that the state is pure. Okay. And what I like to do now is to build quantum measurement theory in the relativistic context. But before doing that, uh, I just want to make a small detour by talking about space-time transformations. And the idea is that we have a phase space, which uh, has got four momentum, four position and four momentum. And then we have a Hilbert space of wave functions on that phase space, or more generally, density matrices on that uh, over that phase space. And now we are interested in 
uh, the action of space-time transformations on wave functions. Okay, so in particular, uh, we look at the Poincaré transformation on a point in the future cube. So that transforms Z into L acting on Z plus B, where B is a real four vector. L gives you the Lorentz transformation, that's the uh, pseudo orthogonal uh, transformation. So L has got six parameters, and B is the real four vector, so it has got four parameters. So that gives you the full 10 parameter group of uh, Poincare transformations. And the question is, uh, can we construct a unitary operator on that Hilbert space such that the action of the unitary operator on a wave function gives you a wave function at uh, transforms space time point? And the answer is yes. And one can work out the unitary operator explicitly. And it's given in terms of that Bergman kernel. Let me back that for two places. So remember, k is this function reasonably simple function. Uh, and then you take that k and evaluate at these arguments, and that gives you a unitary operator, uh, which gives you a Poincare transformation. And in fact, one can prove that this gives you a unitary representation of the Poincare uh, group. And what's been done here, so by unitary operator, uh, we have essentially thinking about the phase space uh, coordinate representation that's meant to be y, not t. Uh, phase space coordinate representation of the unitary operator. That's what we have over here. Okay. But in fact, uh, not only Poincare uh, transformations, we can go further than that by looking at the full 15 parameter uh, conformal transformations and work out uh, explicit unitary representations of the conformal group. So, uh, so for conformal group, we already uh, exhausted the 10 parameters from here. And then we have the four parameter family of special conformal transformation. Uh, it's given by this nonlinear transformation, never mind uh, about the details. Uh, I just want to show that uh, one can obtain explicit unitary representation associated with a special conformal transformation. And the last remaining degrees of freedom in a conformal group is the dilation, which is a scaling with a positive number. And then the unitary representation of the dilation is given uh, up here. Okay. Now, what we have done here, uh, you see everything is given explicitly as phase space functions. And the reason why we can do this is because on the Hilbert space with a reproducing kernel, every operator can be uh, represented as a phase space function, as an integral operator to be more precise. Okay. And this is a very powerful tool uh, that we have. So just going back by a few slides, looking at this expression up here for the Bergman kernel, uh, if you think about the standard quantum mechanics, uh, let's take a unit interval, and you have a free particle inside, so you have the potential. Uh, well, then you have uh, the basis function as a sine function and so on. And then you can construct this expression uh, using uh, sine functions, and then call that uh, resolution of the identity, and you get an identity operator. But of course, if you were to have sine functions here, the sum is divergent. Okay. So in standard quantum mechanics, uh, this sum, uh, the completeness condition, always gives you a divergent sum. Whereas if you have a complex space, they are always convergent. Okay. So, so that is quite an attractive feature of a Hilbert space with reposition kernel, and everything can be written very explicitly in terms of functions on the phase space. So here I have one other example. Suppose we take the generator of uh, translation. Okay. Now the generator is given by the four momentum operator in quantum mechanics. And this operator 
can be written also explicitly as a function on the phase space. And here is what it looks like. Okay. Right. So uh, with that intermezzo, let me return back to uh, the problem of uh, measurement theory. And here is how it works. So for, excuse me, uh, for measurement, we use the idea of uh, positive uh, operator valued measures. So this is language that people in quantum information theory are very much familiar with in talking about uh, measurement theory. It was developed back in the 60s and 70s by people like Brian Davis, Hertzum, Halevo, et cetera, et cetera. And if you haven't encountered the idea of positive operator valued measures, uh, never not to worry, uh, I don't have time to go too much into the de details, but I'll try to emphasize uh, the key uh, results at the end. So here's how it works. So we take the phase space and then we introduce uh, the space of all subsets of the phase space. And uh, so if you have studied probability theory, you know that that just gives you the uh, algebra over the phase space E as representing space of all. Now, uh, for each region in phase space, which is the element of that space of subsets, uh, we have a positive function uh, over that region such that function on the whole of the phase space gives you one. Okay. And that defines what is called a positive operator valued measure on the phase space. And then uh, what we are interested in here in particular is measurement of phase space events. Okay, so you can think of this as maybe a cosmic ray or maybe detection of a, a particle uh, with certain momentum in a, a detected particle accelerator. And for such a detection problem, uh, we can construct uh, the, our POVM using the reproducing kind of function in this particular expression integrated over the region A. And why is this the case? Uh, as I said, not to worry if you haven't uh, come across with this idea. If you have, then you know that this is the natural way to construct it. And then uh, the probability of detecting a phase space event in the region A of the phase space can then be determined by that expression. And a short calculation then uh, shows that this is in fact given simply by the integral of the diagonal element of the density matrix over that region in the phase space. So the diagonal elements of the phase of the density matrix gives you a probability distribution over the phase space. So that gives you the probability of uh, measurement outcome. What about uh, the state transformation rule? Uh, again, uh, the theory of such uh, thing in the non relativistic quantum theory is where established. We uh, apply the same idea in the rel <laughs> relativistic context. <coughs> Excuse me. So for transformation rule, we have the density operator which transforms into another density matrix. So what we need is a super operator which turns one density matrix into another. So we need an operator with four indices, if you like. And uh, explicitly, it's given again in terms of the Bergman kernel function in this form. And using that, uh, we define the transformation rule. So you, if you have rho zero as your initial rate, uh, density matrix, and then the T acting on row zero gives you the new density matrix, except you have to normalize. Okay. Uh, but substituting this expression in here uh, gives you uh, a simpler expression, which says uh, the result, the resulting density matrix after measurement is the average of a state, capital Psi, which I'm going to define in a second, over the initial uh, density on the diagonal element. And what is the capital Psi? Well, the capital Psi 
is given by this combination of the Bergman kernel. However, Psi itself is a state, it's a pure state density matrix associated with the Bergman kernel. And the reason is because the Bergman kernel uh, not only is holomorphic, it's also a square integral by construction. And therefore, one can regard the kernel function as defining a wave function with a suitable normalization. So if you take the kernel function, divide by normalization, and define that to be your wave function, and then you construct uh, a projection operator onto that wave function, that's a pure state density matrix, then you average that pure state density matrix over the region A using the initial wave uh, den density operator, <coughs> the diagonal elements of the de initial density operator. And that gives you uh, the, the outcome of the measurement. And in particular, if the outcome happens to be a phase space point, then the resulting wave function is a pure state given by that expression. And that pure state, in fact, turns out to be uh, the coherent state in this context. So in more explicit terms, it's given by this expression. So that's the coherent state. And it's, it's actually a coherent state associated with the conformity. Okay. So the outcome of the measurement gives you the coherent state if you detect a point on a phase space. But if you detect uh, an event in a region over the phase space, then you average the coherent state over that region using the initial density matrix, and that gives you the outcome state. <coughs> okay. So that gives a uh, relativistic measurement theory in a fully uh, covariant way. And we can also speak about a situation where we perform a measurement but do not record the outcome. And in that case, the resulting state is given by uh, the averaging uh, of the coherent state uh, using the initial density matrix over the whole of the phase of space. So that represents the decoherence uh, effect, if you like. And that would be the output state. So that gives us a uh, measurement of the state. Uh, now, now I'd like to say a few more things about coherent state. Uh, I've already hinted at the fact that they represent coherent states associated with the conformal group. What that means, well, coherent states are states uh, having certain uh, invariance property associated with certain group uh, action. So in this context, we are looking at uh, conformal group, or if you like, the unitary representations of the conformal group on uh, the future tube, or, or sorry, over the, on the Hilbert space over the future tube. And we have already written down uh, explicitly the unitary representations of the conformal transformations. And the idea is that if you apply, so for example, take Poincare transformation as an example, if you apply Poincare transformation on a coherent state, then the result is another coherent state uh, <coughs> at another point. So what that means, let me just backtrack slightly. Okay, so the point is we use the Bergman color, which is holomorphic in the first variable u, and it's anti-holomorphic in the second variable z. Okay, but we are regarding this function as a function of u parameterized by z, okay? But both u and z are phase space points, okay? So this gives you, the coherent state gives you a wave function of the phase space in the u variable, which is parameterized by phase space point, which is z, okay? So I said that earlier, I said that earlier. Uh, so that's what we have for our coherent state. So the coherent state is a fu wave function of the phase space, but it also depends on a parameter, which is the 
if you like the plus group, there's their point. So with that in mind, if we apply a coherent state wave function with parameter Z, uh, a Poincare, unitary Poincare uh, operator, then we get a coherent state at W, where W is the inverse Poincare transformation of Z on the phase plane. Just a quick time warning, you have 10 minutes or five plus five if you would like to leave time for discussion. Yeah, I, I finished within five minutes, thank you. And, and likewise, one can look at the action of the spatial conformal uh, group on the coherent states. And here the calculation is quite uh, elaborate, but one can show that you get a coherent state back uh, with the caveat that uh, there's an added phase coming out in this particular case. But since the states are defined only up to uh, overall scale, uh, that remains a coherent state. And likewise, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, like, yeah, sorry. likewise, the action of uh, dilation group on the coherent state gives you another coherent state at uh, phase, phase point W, which is the inverse of the direction transformation. Okay, now to understand the property of coherent states, uh, it is often useful to uh, transform into a Fourier representation. And here's how the Fourier representation is defined. So if psi of z is any wave function on that Hilbert space, then we define uh, its Fourier transform by this integral. That gives you a uh, capital psi of p. And then the inverse Fourier transform one can work out to be given by this equation, which is integrated over the forward uh, light cone. Uh, with that in mind, we can take the Fourier transform of uh, the coherent state. And then a short calculation shows that the result is given by equation 40 here. Now, <coughs> Remember Z is the phase space point. We have X minus I R. X denotes the Minkowski space time point. So in terms of the X dependence, the Fourier tra transform is just a plane wave. Okay. But moving on to in or into the future tube, there's an exponential damping. So in particular, if the focal point of the coherent state, uh, the point Z, lies in the low mass region of the phase space, then the damping of the high energy Fourier components uh, becomes rather significant. But if you push back all the way to the real Minkowski space, which is not part of the feature tube, then uh, what we have is this uh, plane wave and and you might think, well, then the Fourier transform surely will give you the delta function. Well, uh, it turns out that the answer is sort of yes. So uh, it is well known that if you take any holomorphic wave function on a uh, future tube, then in the limit of going to the real space time, Minkowski space limit, you must get a tempered distribution. Okay, so you can't avoid. But of course, but because observables in quantum field theory are given by holomorphic functions, and in quantum field theory you take the limit to the real space-time point, so you can't avoid dealing with distributions, dealing with generalized functions in quantum field theory. But we are not doing that. We stay on the future too, which we can because the imaginary component has got physical interpretation as related to as inverse momentum. Okay, so we are sort of proposing rather alternative way of doing things uh, where we can get away with many of the divergences you have to deal with in quantum field theory. Now, uh, just finally one or two remarks. So the coherent states are the most localized states, okay, in the phase space. And in fact, this is due to the fact that if you have any wave function phi in a Huber space, then phi by phi is bounded by the Bergman kernel. And one can prove that, I won't go into the details, 
And from that, one can show that uh, if you have a density matrix, I should keep the details in the interest of time, but if you have a density matrix, then the diagonal elements gives you the probability distribution over the phase space, but that is bounded above by uh, the eighth power of the mass of the particle associated with the phase space point Z, okay? And inequality is attained if you have a coherent state. So this gives you a kind of uh, localization theorem. It's a kind of uncertainty relation for relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, because it says that no wave function can be sharply peaked in the phase space region. Beyond that is given by the coherent state. Okay? There are no delta functions. So putting that differently, uh, if you have a uh, quantum state, a density matrix, with diagonal elements gives you the uh, probability density function, then the maximum value that your uh, density can take is given by the eighth power, uh, the inverse eighth power of the, the reduced Compton wavelength uh, associated with that phase space point. Okay? And therefore, if an event is detected to have occurred at phase space point, point Z, then the outcome wave function would be the coherent state, which is most peaked at that point. Okay? And in that case, the bound is saturated. And, but on the other hand, density matrix or density function, the diagonal elements, they have to add up to one. So you have to have a function which has to integrate over the phase space. So you can't have two high values of rho away from the detection point. Okay. So in particular, uh, it, it follows that for a system of short Compton wavelength, uh, the event will be highly localized automatically in phase space. Okay? Uh, there's no way around that. And we can view the coherent states, therefore, as representing the most uh, classical states uh, of the system. Uh, what I've talked about is based on the, on the paper, which uh, you can uh, access online. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And we have a few minutes for questions. I see two hands. Uh, Lajos. Yep. Uh, uh, where does it reduce in the non relativistic limit? I imagine that it reduces uh, to uh, Schrodinger quantum mechanics. Uh, mm -hmm. as to the density matrix and the dynamics, but where does the joint measurement of position and momentum reduce in the non-relativistic limit? What is the, if it exists at all, what is the non-relativistic limit of the, of your coherent states? Okay, okay. so uh, firstly, uh, yeah, non relativistic limits. Uh, I'm not sure what that means in this context, to be honest. Uh, but I, I do have an answer to your question nonetheless. Uh, and in fact, that was worked out by Brian Davis back either in the 60s or 70s, where he did formulate a uh, measurement theory involving both position and momentum. And it can be, and he shows in his famous book on open quantum systems that this can be done using uh, POVMs. So I don't know about the state of the coherent state, but uh, in non, and, and he sort of explains that you know, physicists have this preconception that if you just think about moment of measurement, then you, know, you can't have localization in both, and therefore you can't measure both, but that's a mistake he explains in his book. Uh, because if you use uh, positive operator value measures, then uh, that gives you a way in mean, meaningful manner to talk about the joint measurement of position and momentum without violating uncertainty relations and whatnot in quantum mechanics. So, 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 that, so it can be done in, in non relative quantum mechanics, but that's not necessary to say that will be the, the limit. Uh, here, we don't have any. Uh, 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 
way to see in obvious way what one means by uh, non relative limits. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mauro, next question. Yes. Um, well, first of all, th thanks a lot for the most beautiful and informative talk. And my, my question is the following. Uh, actually, when once you're dealing with coherent states, for instance, you can write down explicitly the Calabi's diastasis function, this is starting from a killer potential. And uh, in this way, you can you, you have also a canonical killer potential and can also simplify also the, the expression for the Bergman uh, kernel. And uh, this, I would like to know whether then this, this is feasible in this context. And, and also that is the, the property of um, actually the coherent states in quite, under quite general conditions that they minimize the product of, of, the, um, of the uncertainties. So in, 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 in this case, you have also, maybe they minimize also if you have a, a, a a relativistic uncertainty principle involving both the, the both the, the space variables and the momentum and the energy and time. It is feasible that is to do this in the you have this property in your setting. That is first of all this right. this general. Yes. Okay. So uh I wasn't quite sure what the first part of the question was, but let me comment on the second part first. Uh, so as for uncertainty relations, uh, I can certainly work out uh, delta P squared mm -hmm. because I know how to calculate that. Uh, delta X squared is a bit harder. I'm not sure how to calculate that. Uh, not that it's not to say you can't, uh, it just means I can't. <laughs> and the reason is because X is not a, a holomorphic function because it's given by Z minus plus Z bar. So uh, on, on phase space, and if I don't have homomorphic function, it's slightly tricky to deal with that. So, uh, so that's one of the things I'm, I'm interested in looking into, but I haven't had chance to work that out. Uh, so so the, the uncertainty relation, as we know it in quantum mechanics, I don't know exactly how that's going to span out, uh, but what I can say for sure is that this is localization bound which means you can't have very peak wave function in phase space. So it's not possible to localize both in X and P space uh, just by complex analysis, nothing else. So first part of the question about the Keller potential and so on, I wasn't quite sure. It's actually, you, you, you have a Keller metric, so you can write down a, a, a also Keller potential. And actually, with this killer potential, you can man manufacture a canonical killer potential from, uh, from that, which is the Calabis, the, the, that is, you have the general function, this Calabis diastatic functions. And from the, this, for instance, you have also an, an ex uh, a very neat expressions of, of, of coherent state wave functions. I don't know whether yes. that oh. did work okay, out. So there's a lot in, in a geometric quantization, in coherent state quantization, and using killer, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Bresen quantization, etc. Uh, so the mathematics is all very closely linked to all of that stuff people did in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so killer potential here is nothing but the log of the Bergman coming. Yes. And, and yes, so it's all, I mean, mathematically speaking, it's all closely uh, linked to all those ideas, yes. 